Coming up on iOS Today, Rose, Mary Orchard, and I, Micah Sargent, have an excellent episode all about the accessibility features for your iPhones, your iPads, and more that are available for everybody and that everybody should use. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is iOS Today with Rosemary Orchard and Micah Sargent, episode 696, recorded Tuesday, March 19th, 2024, for Thursday, March 28th, 2024. iOS accessibility features for everyone. Hello and welcome to iOS Today, the show where we talk all things iOS, tvOS, iPadOS, HomePodOS, watchOS, visionOS, and all of the OSs that Apple has on offer. We love to talk about them here on iOS Today, love to help you make the most of those devices you purchase by sharing different tips, tricks, apps, and everything in between so that you know you are getting everything you possibly can out of that device you hold in your hand. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am Rosemary Orchard. And as always, super excited to be here. I'm recording with you, Micah. Yay, let's have a fun episode. Uh, This week, we thought we would talk about accessibility because, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, uh, you know, I think I bring this up a lot. Uh, We talk about this a lot. Apple does a really good job of being mindful when it comes to accessibility. Uh, The company does not treat it as an afterthought. And I think because of that, it encourages third-party developers to also not treat it as an afterthought. So what you're given is a a system, a platform uh, that is accessibility-minded. And what that means to me is that you know, there are times where I may need an accessibility feature that I wouldn't otherwise need, right? I don't have uh, any per- any particular uh, concern that would require me to use uh, some of these features regularly. But what's great about accessibility is that it truly can be for everyone. And that the more that we kind of familiarize ourselves with these tools and with these options, uh, the more you might find that there's something in there for you as well. Uh, So without further ado, uh, tell us about the first accessibility feature you have, and then I will share an accessibility feature that I use every single day of my life. Well, this is uh, a fun one because I have noticed more and more people seem to be missing notifications, right? Um, And notifications are kind of hard to keep track of. You know, there's something coming in, it's buzzing on your phone, maybe it doesn't buzz um, and things like that. But what you can do on iOS, so if you go under settings and then you go into the accessibility area, Um, And then you go down into, and I have just lost it, which is really not very helpful. So I'll just uh, use the search to find it. It's audio and visual. That's the one. If you're under audio and visual, so settings, accessibility, audio and visual, then you scroll to the bottom. There is a section called visual, which has an option for LED flash for alerts. And if you go in, then you can turn this on and you can set this to a flash while unlocked. And what I also really love, if you've got this toggled on, you can turn this off for flashing in silent mode. Um, and this, I think, is a feature that, well, I know for a fact this feature didn't really, uh, didn't exist before. There, These two options, flash while unlocked and flash in silent mode, were not uh, things. You could just turn on and off flashing. So what will happen um, is when you get a notification, the flash on the back of your phone will light up as well. Um, so you will get an audio and a visual notification. But what I really like about the two options that they've got here, so you can turn off flashing while unlocked, which is probably while you're using your phone, and turn off flash in silent mode. That means that if, for example, uh, like uh, one of my uh, uh, classmates in ballet a couple of weeks ago, uh, this was going off and it was driving everybody crazy because she put her phone down (laughs) on the floor face down pointing up next to the ballet bar so every time uh, somebody from her work sent her a message
message because somebody at work was sending her a bunch of messages, um, it kept flashing. And so I showed her, hey, you can turn it off while it's in silent mode. And she had no idea that was a thing. Um, and most of the people in my class turns out didn't know that you could have your phone flash uh, when you get a notification as well. So, you know, everybody learned something from that. Uh, but yeah, the, having the flash is a really useful uh, bonus if you are somebody who is likely to get into a zone and completely bypass all of those notifications. Uh, the only thing I'll say is if you have folks uh, with epilepsy or similar in your life, then you may not want to use this feature because the flash is incredibly bright and it's not just on off. It's beep beep. It's like a, a double a double flash. So that could potentially be uh, problematic for those folks. But it's a very useful feature to have at home. I really wish uh, back in college that the the silence toggle was an option because I remember uh, being in Spanish class and there was a student in that class who had the flash turned on. And the first part of me uh, was like, oh, go you. You know that that feature exists. You know how to turn it on. And mind you, this was a person who, um, as far as, you know, anyone knew or as far as my interactions went, it was not necessarily uh, a, a feature that was needed. Uh, and so it was just, you know, an added, as you've talked about, an added benefit to be able to see it. But in the middle of class, when you're trying to focus and then you just get, get this glint out of the corner of your eye, rather frustrating. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that silence, uh, yeah. the, the, Turn it off when it's on silent is a is a great uh, added toggle there that I'm glad Apple yes. has considered for sure. Um, well, one other thing ahead. I want to mention, I know we're not in Shortcuts Corner, but there are Shortcuts actions for turning LED flash on and off. So what you can also do is use Shortcuts Automations to hook this into focus mode so that, for example, while you're in your class focus mode for college, it could be turned off. And then when you turn off your class focus mode, you can turn the LED flash back on and that can be very useful for that as well. Nice. Um, the feature that I want to talk about is, again, one that I use quite literally every day. Uh, it is a feature that I started using by way of Georgia Dow. Uh, Georgia is, uh, a, is a regular, I guess, uh, contributor on uh, the Twit Network and has also uh, been a former colleague of mine when I worked at iMore. And Georgia... Uh, mentioned this feature a long, long time ago, and I'll, I'll explain the feature in just a moment, but I got into um, sleep research and sleep science and sort of the, the understanding of the way that different things affect our sleep, and this feature became even more important. So, you know, uh, many of you know, I'm sure, and if we could show my screen here, if I swipe down from the top right corner of the screen, I have this option here to bring down the brightness of my phone. And I can bring it all the way down to the bottom, and you're not going to see that on the screen, obviously, but for me, I can see that the actual display has gotten darker. And if I bring it up, then it gets a lot brighter. If I bring it down, it gets a lot darker. But if you've ever been in a dark room uh, and you bring down the brightness all the way to the bottom, it's still pretty bright, particularly if you visit a page that is white. If you do have uh, the, the mode that switches to where things go into dark mode at night, a lot of the UI will change, but there are some web pages, are some apps that don't take advantage of that, and therefore those screens remain very bright, and that means that your retinas are being blasted with very bright light. And I, I won't go into too much detail because I always do this and then it takes too long. But uh, if you if you're curious about it at all, if you are a little bit of a nerd like I am, look up the term suprachiasmatic nuclei, and that will tell you what you need to know about why it's important to not blast your eyes with artificial light after the sun has gone down. So, understanding that even at the lowest brightness it's still a pretty bright display, what you can do is go into accessibility, you can tap on display and text, and then you come down to a section that says reduce white point. And what this feature does is it takes the intensity of bright colors and drops them to a lower value. So it's saying the brightest that something can ever be, that's the white point, is 
lower than what the default is set to. So when I turn this on, it, uh, you can see that I have the, and, and this is, you're going to have to think kind of backwards here because we're reducing the white point. So the higher the percentage, the darker it is because you're, it's, it's how much am I reducing that brightness? So I've got mine set to about 90% and you can toggle this based on what you want. But what I like to do is, uh, as you can see, we've kind of got, let's see, what's the brightness right now? About uh, three quarters. If I bring this down, and for those who are watching, you're able to kind of see this. Uh, there's maybe still, you can kind of still see what the screen is showing. But if I turn on reduce white point, it all but disappears for all of you uh, watching the video. Again, this is the physical display, not the one that you're seeing via AirPlay, which of course is not going to change at all. So um, I actually have mine set. Uh, it's not something that I have to go all the way into that setting to get to. Um, we'll talk about this feature a little bit uh, later, but there's an accessibility shortcut option again that we'll talk about later, but I only have this as my one accessibility shortcut. So all I have to do is go into control panel, hit the accessibility shortcut button, and it makes my phone go dark. And that again, just makes it so that the brightness is even less at night because I like to lay in my bed right before I go to bed and do the New York Times crossword. And even with dark mode that has recently been added to the New York Times crossword, it is still uh, a pretty bright UI. So having this feature turned on helps keep that nice and dark so that it's not kind of disturbing my sleep as much as, as possible. Uh, there you go. The super chiasmatic nucleus, that's a singular, but we have two of them. So that's why I say super chiasmatic nuclei. Um, it is, uh, uh, quickly, the one part of our brain that has direct exposure um, to light from the outside world. Like the rest of our brain is all encased, but there is a direct connection between our eyes leading all the way back to the suprachiasmatic nuclei. So they actually can quote unquote see themselves. Uh, and they're actually, one is found in a lizard. It's on the back of their head and it's used to track when the sun is up versus down. And sometimes they, there are lizards who also have vestigial suprachiasmatic nucleus uh, because they don't use them anymore, but they once did. Anyway, I said I wasn't going to go into it. I blame Kevin. Kevin showed the screen. Uh, all right, let's move on, Rosemary. What's next? <laughs> Well, uh, there are a whole bunch of other features that you can use, but one of them is, that I love to use is the Apple TV remote built into iOS. So I have this set up in Control Center, so I can swipe into Control Center. Um, and then once I've uh, chosen an Apple TV, I actually get an Apple TV here. So I'll use uh, the bedroom Apple TV for this demonstration purpose. Um, and once it's connected, my Apple TV remote might look a little bit different for those of you watching the video. So uh, we, I've got a square in the middle, an upper arrow at the top, down arrow at the bottom, left arrow on the left, right arrow on the right. And this is a feature that you can actually turn on in settings. Um, so I will stop playing with my focus mode. Um, and one of the favorite, one of my things that I just always do whenever I'm like, maybe there's something for the Apple TV remote to make it better. Um, searching for Apple in the Apple settings, not great. Uh, searching for TV, however, it does help because if I go under set it, things accessibility apple tv remote uh, then i will see that there is the option to turn on directional buttons which i have enabled um, there's also a uh, live tv buttons that you can enable here um, and so if i were to pop back into uh, this and choose i'll stick with the bedroom one um, then uh, now uh, because i have the live tv uh, option here um, i've also got some menu and channel buttons uh, in the uh, bottom corners uh, i'll turn those back off i'll just turn off the directional buttons for folks as well so that they can see what the difference is. And the difference is basically just that those buttons don't appear. But I find as much as I love the, the trackpad swiping on my actual physical Apple TV remote, uh, for some reason, it just does not work with my brain when I am using my phone. Um, and this is a little bit easier to navigate. And I turned it on for my parents and they much prefer it. They like the up, down, left, right buttons that they can just tap and they know what it does instead of having to try and swipe in uh, any particular direction. So yeah, you can turn on directional buttons for your Apple TV remote. Nice. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, 
Also, uh, another, this is not quite an accessibility thing, but it has to do with that uh, remote app. Uh, as of the latest version of iOS and the latest version of tvOS, when you use, when you and another person have an account on the Apple TV, if you use the remote on your iPhone, then it will switch to your account on the Apple TV. If they use their remote on their iPhone, it will switch to their account on the Apple TV. So that fast user switching uh, can happen, which is really nice. And this is this is if you're doing it kind of from the main screen. So if you're in the middle of a show, it's obviously not going to, uh, to switch that. But uh, from the main screen, being able to switch back and forth between users because it knows that you're using your own phone, so you are that user, is is quite handy. Uh, if only more app developers, especially the big content creators, would integrate with Apple's own user switching, that would be great that I would use that feature and care about it a whole lot more. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah, yep. that's, that's frustrating. Now, this next feature is easily, I think, one of the most used accessibility features uh, that I've seen from what I call regular people, meaning the folks who aren't super steeped in technology, who aren't talking about it all the time. Um, unfortunately, it's often used when someone breaks their iPhone screen, uh, but it is, again, a feature that I see so many people using even even in some cases, it, it has nothing to do with because their phone screen is broken. Uh, we just heard from someone last week, I believe it was, who, well, I should say last episode, um, who talked about using it as part of their uh, camera, their photo taking routine. Uh, so tell us about guided access. Uh, Micah, I think you're actually referring to assistive touch. Oh, which no, is part I, of the am <laughs> I am uh, thinking. I am thinking. I have touch. also seen quite a few regular <laughs> users using guided access, though, so don't worry. It's okay. Womp we'll put that womp. one in next. Um, <laughs> but so the accessibility shortcut and specifically assistive touch um, are um, you, if you've ever seen that floating white dot on somebody's iPhone screen um, or maybe an iPad screen, then uh, you will probably be uh, some more familiar with this. So I I now have enabled assistive touch on my iPhone and I've done this through my accessibility shortcut. So I'll just uh, turn off assistive touch for folks. Um, so under settings and accessibility, um, then you can actually uh, set your accessibility shortcut. And this is uh, something that will then happen whenever you triple press the power button on your phone. Um, so if you've got uh, an iPhone with a home screen button at the bottom, then it'll happen if you, d if you triple press on that. Um, and and so you can obviously turn this off, but I have it uh, set to ask me what I would like to do. I may or may not have primed it for the show. A little uh, <laughs> teaser in here. Uh, there's Apple Watch mirroring enabled, uh, control nearby devices and assistive touch. Um, and so the assistive touch is the one that we're interested in here because that's the one with this floating on screen button. Um, and then once you have uh, your... Uh, assistive touch setup or enabled, then you can use this for all sorts of things. So for a while, it was really common for um, certain third-party retailers to turn on assistive touch and tell people to use that instead of the home button to stop the home button failing. Um, but uh, under settings, accessibility, touch, assistive touch, yeah, it's a little bit of a, a, a rabbit warren to get there. You can customize the menu and you can add more things to this. So this could be quite useful for, uh, you know, easily accessing the camera, for example. Ta-da, I just used it to quickly access my camera. Um, or I can change one of these uh, to do a double tap or uh, to do a, sp a particular gesture or to lock the rotation. And there's a whole bunch of things here. There's accessibility shortcuts as well. There's scroll gestures. There's a dwell and then, and this is the bit where I really get excited and nerdy. You can actually run shortcuts from the um, assistive touch uh, menu. So I can have a shortcut in here, which is really, really cool. Um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of things, but honestly, this is often used in conjunction with other things. Um, you know, you can use it for quickly accessing the control center. I would highly recommend looking into this if you uh, have a, uh, a friend or a relative or you yourself struggle with access uh, all the you know hidden gestures in the iPhone, so swiping down from the top right to access um, control center versus down from the top left 
or at the notification center and maybe they're always pressing and holding the side button to lock it but they, then it triggers Siri and people get frustrated. I know that my dad gets very frustrated when he thinks he's doing the right thing but it triggers the thing that he's not looking for. So putting some of the most frequently wanted actions in here like locking your device and things like that can be very handy and uh, yeah that's part of in my case, the accessibility shortcut uh, that is uh, on my iPhone, along with uh, Apple Watch mirroring. So I'll just turn off assistive touch here and I'll just show folks uh, the Apple Watch mirroring just as I'm as I'm here. I didn't put it in the show notes, but it's very cool. So Apple Watch mirroring is a feature that you can uh, use on your iPhone to mirror your Apple Watch. And uh, it does take a little while to connect. Uh, my Apple Watch is uh, awake and showing things, but there we go. Now I actually have my Apple Watch here on my iPhone to show off, which can be very handy for iOS today. It's also quite handy when I'm trying to, uh, you know, troubleshoot something with my parents, but I'm not there in person to see their watch screen. If you've ever had somebody like using FaceTime and kind of not really, you know, they've got their phone, like their watch is like mostly hidden under their sleeve and they're kind of pointing the camera at it and you can't see what they're talking about at all. It's very, very difficult. So turning on the uh, Apple Watch mirroring for remote troubleshooting in that case has been very handy for me. So there we go, a couple of uh, sneaky features. And now uh, you can tell us, Micah, about guided access, perhaps. Yes. First, before I, I talk about guided access, I want to talk about a relatively new feature called assistive access. So we're kind of bridging the gap between assistive touch and guided access. This is assistive access. And this is a new feature. I I won't be able to go through the setup process here because it will lock down my iPhone in this whole new way. But if you can go to the uh, page that I linked, uh, Kevin, I can kind of talk about it. So assistive access is a uh, mode for iPhone that Apple created for folks who might have uh, certain cognitive disabilities. Uh, but it's also just for people who uh, need to have, it doesn't necessarily need to be cognitive disabilities. It's just for anyone who needs to have a far more focused, far uh, much, a far more simple uh, experience. So it focuses on essential apps uh, and then these apps show up bigger. So for example, instead of calling it phone, it's called calls so that you can just choose to have, you know, your calls, your camera, your messages, your music, and your photos. You can choose and customize which apps get get selected. So again, calls, camera, messages, uh, music, photos, and other apps can be um, any number of things. So you can, uh, what's kind of cool is that with assistive access, you can add these uh, kind of sub apps. So for example, when you tap on camera, it has some options. I want to take a photo. I want to take a selfie. I want to take a video or I want to take a video selfie. You can also do one for weather. Uh, there are a bunch of different apps to be able to, um, to, to add these to assistive access. Now, uh, what's great about this as well is that it's easy to set up and to get in and out of if need be. Uh, there's an assistive access kind of passcode that you set up and you're kind of meant to set it up for the person who needs it. But again, this is a great feature for someone who might have cognitive disabilities, but I also see this as a great feature for someone who just isn't familiar with all of the stuff that an iPhone can do and needs to just get to the basics. How do I make a call? How do I send a message? Make these big buttons that are able to be accessed. That's what assistive access does. So uh, that feature is also in settings. You scroll all the way down to the bottom and there's assistive access. You choose set up assistive access and go through the process there. Um, so relatively new feature that Apple had been talking about for a while to give a new kind of full mode to the iPhone that simplifies things. Um, and I will be honest in saying that I sometimes forget that, that feature is there and uh, it's come up a couple of times on Ask the Tech Guys when people are needing to provide, uh, you know, smartphones for their uh, elderly relatives or whomever it might be. And this is a great way to uh, provide that while, again, making it something that can be used. Uh, guided access is even more locked down than assistive access. Guided access lets you use a single app as the one app that can be used on a device. So for example, 
Say you are, uh, you've got your iPhone and you are at the grocery store and your child is saying, I really want to see all those photos we took of the, um, of the, the, I don't know, animals at the zoo the other day. And you say, cool, love to show you that. Uh, but I don't want you accidentally transferring $50,000 out of the bank account into, uh, I don't know, wherever. I don't want you tap any, uh, tapping all over in a bunch of different apps. Guided access lets you lock the iPhone, your iPad, whatever it happens to be, to a single app. And then it also gives you the ability to control what features are available. So let's uh, let me show you what this looks like. So I toggle on guided access. And the first thing I do is I set up a passcode. Uh, you can also choose to use it with face ID. So I will uh, set the passcode. And as you can see, I love this. Uh, Apple has in recent versions of iOS stopped displaying the numbers at the bottom of the screen so that you all can't see them. I do have the numbers in front of me. So I'm able to create a passcode. But even while I'm talking about this, you're not able to see what that passcode is. So I've got the passcode set. I can set time limits, so I can even create an alarm. So it says, play a sound and have the remaining guided access time spoken before the time ends so that I could potentially hear it. I, you know, give them 30 minutes or something like that. Um, I can create a, I can add it to the accessibility shortcut. And then I can also choose um, to display auto lock. So it basically says, how long does it take for your iPhone to lock during a guided access session? I'll leave that on default. So now what I do is I will go to the app that I want to use and let's go with uh, the music app and I will triple click one, two, three, the side button and I will choose guided access. And now this experience is asking me uh, what are, you know, what, what do you want to give access to? What do you not? And this is kind of cool too. circle areas on the screen you would like to disable. So for example, maybe I want to have this portion at the top of the screen, not be able to be tapped on or accessed for whatever reason. I've also got options so I can say you can or can't press the side buttons. You can or can't press the volume buttons, uh, whether motion is allowed. So kind of turning it to the side to see it that way. Uh, if software keyboards are able to be popped up, if people can touch and if there's a time limit, and then I would tap start to turn on guided access, at which point this would be locked until I unlock it and uh, type in that passcode. So I'm going to choose cancel because I don't want to go into guided access. Um, but, and because especially I'm not sure if it'll this, if it'll turn off this airplay session. So, uh, that would be concerning, but think about, uh, a common place where this would be used is if you're using your iPad as a kiosk at a, uh, maybe you, you have a, a small business and you sell, uh, cupcakes that are decorated like someone's face. Um, and you want to, you know, do have them be able to take a photo of themselves and then order the cupcakes right there in the store. You don't want them going into Safari and brow, basically like treating your store like a public library or something. That's where guided access comes in and it keeps it locked to that single experience. Uh, tell us about the next feature, Rosemary. Yeah, sure. So Siri is a wonderful tool uh, when it works. Uh, I did have <laughs> a, a moment the other day where um, uh, I was watching an episode of uh, The Rookie uh, and he asked um, uh, the the Apple lady uh, to set an alarm or set an alarm for in an hour. And the Apple lady on the rookie said, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. My HomePod sitting behind my TV, on the other hand, apparently uh, is familiar enough with Nathan Fillion's voice that it was just like, sure, I'm going to set an alarm for like 1.17 a.m. for you. That's fine. Um, and so, yeah, I, I uh, had to figure out how to go in and turn that off, which was a, a, a thing that I was not expecting to have to do. But speaking to Siri can often end up, if, especially if you've got a speech impediment or you're in a loud environment, uh, with uh, some unexpected results. And you know what? It's it's sometimes easier to just type 
wouldn't you say? Um, so under settings, um, if you go into accessibility and then Siri, there are a whole bunch of options here. So you can change your Siri pause time to have a longer pause time or a longest pause time, um, which is how long it will wait for you to finish speaking. So if you often get distracted mid thought and you just need a little bit longer to finish what you were saying, uh, then you can uh, you can uh, change that. You can set change the speaking rate from very slow to Rosemary Orchard speed, um, <laughs> whichever you prefer. Uh, you can prefer silent responses, spoken responses, or have um, Siri be intelligent and figure out how it should respond. Um, if it should always listen for Siri or Hey Siri. So if you keep your phone face down and you want it to still be able to talk to the Apple lady inside your phone um, whilst uh, your phone is face down, then you can uh, turn on this feature. I turn it off because then my HomePod definitely picks it up and uh, whether or not Siri will announce notifications and if it can hang up calls. But the one right at the top is type to Siri. And if you turn on type to Siri, then when you activate Siri, which I've just done by pressing and holding that side button, um, you get a little pop-up box, which I can type, what's the uh, weather whoop, like today? And send that off. And Siri's saying, it looks like it's rain today. Ta-da. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's been raining and drizzly on and off pretty much all day today. Not a great day for weather, but a great day to type to Siri because it got me the answer I needed. And this can also be quite useful if, uh, you know, if you're somebody who would like to be able to type more often. And don't forget, once you've got this keyboard up, you've still got dictation to uh, be able to, you know, work with Siri through your voice as well. So yeah, type to Siri, lovely option. All right, and we've got a few more here. Uh, in, and this next one, I think, is is very important. Um, and I think something that people don't necessarily know about. We know that, excuse me, our AirPods are, if you, if you have um, AirPods Pro, you have active noise cancellation, which, of course, uh, will sort of do its best to cancel out the background noise in your environment while you're listening to music. And it does that through both of your AirPods. But let's say, for example, that you only have one ear that works well, or you perhaps only have one ear that, uh, you know, you use to hear things, or maybe you just occasionally, uh, for example, listen to music from one AirPod while you're laying on your pillow with the other one, which would uh, be kind of covered up. There is an option to turn, to make it possible for noise cancellation to work with just one AirPod. Because if you use your AirPods without this feature turned on and you take one AirPod out of your ear, then noise cancellation, active noise cancellation turns off by default. So how does someone, Rosemary, go about making it possible for just one AirPod to provide noise cancellation? Well, first off, you're going to need to have the right AirPods. You're going to need AirPods Pro for this with noise cancellation. If you don't have noise cancellation, then it's unfortunately not going to work. Uh, but under settings and accessibility, under AirPods, you can select your AirPods. Uh, so I'm going to use my AirPods Pro for this. And then there are a couple of options around press speed, press and hold duration, and so on. But you can most importantly turn on this noise cancellation with one AirPod. And once that's turned on, if you've got one AirPod in your ear, it doesn't matter if it's the left AirPod or the right AirPod, then you will still get that noise cancellation, which is really nice. Um, there's some other options in here as well, which regardless of what kind of AirPods you have, it's worth having a quick look to see about things like the press speed and press and hold duration um, to uh, you know make sure that you are definitely making the most out of uh, all of these features. You can also control spatial audio settings if you have uh, AirPods which have spatial audio features, which is very useful to know. And then uh, we've got a few more, including <laughs> the feature that some might find annoying. Uh, say I, I message somebody happy birthday or congratulations. And by default, when they open one of those notifications or when they open that message, uh, they will see little message effects take place on the screen. And some people like those, some people hate them. You can also purposely choose to send one. Uh, the one that I like to use is called Echo. And I like to use it with emoji. So you can kind of type in some emoji and choose echo and it will send a bunch of messages that kind of like swirl around on the screen uh, that provide just this fun look, right? 
Um, but again, some people are annoyed by that. They're annoyed by the fact that it kind of gets in the way of what they're trying to do. You can turn that off, Rosemary, right? You can indeed, Micah. And uh, I'm just going to show folks uh, in case they're curious. So I'm sending a message to Micah. I just tapped and held on that send button. And then if I pop over to screen, here it is. That is the Micah's favorite echo feature. So I'll send that off to him. Um, but <laughs> you can turn this off for your incoming messages. So you'll still see that it says sent with echo or whatever, um, but you don't have to necessarily experience that. Um, so settings, accessibility, which is pretty much where everything is that we've talked about today. And then there's a motion section. So there's a general reduced motion. Um, so if the uh, parallax uh, effects on your iPhone bother you, for some people, it can make them feel a little motion sick. Uh, you can turn that off. You can also turn off auto playing message effects and auto playing animated images. There's also some bonus features in here, which I'm going to quickly mention. Dim flashing lights. So if a video contains repeated flashing or strobing lights, it will automatically dim it. Um, and the video timeline will display when it's flash when the flashing lights are being dimmed so that you're aware of that. There's also automatically playing pre video previews and limiting frame rates. Um, so if uh, high frame rates bother you, or maybe you're just really trying to save on data, then that could be a useful option to know about. But auto play message effects uh, is uh, something I turned off for my grandmother because she kept using message effects to message one of her friends and her friend knows how to use message effects. So kept sending messages back with message effects and it was really bothering my grandmother. So I, I turned it off so that she's uh, not seeing them all the time anymore, <laughs> which is... Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's certainly engendering less questions uh, in the tech support area. Uh, it's not necessarily solving the problem, but, you know, I also had to work with her friend and said, she doesn't know that she's doing it. Can you please stop sending them back? Because it's just getting her very, very confused. <laughs> That's funny. Um, a, a very important uh, feature that can be turned on for folks who need to have a little bit more understanding of what is going on in uh, the scenes inside of videos, for example, uh, you can kind of set by default to have audio descriptions made available to you. So uh, this is different from simple subtitles or captions or something like that. Audio descriptions are a an audible description of what is being seen on screen. Uh, if you, not every film, not every show will provide this functionality, but if you are option, I should say, but if you have seen a show that has this, I recommend just giving it a listen just so you could kind of understand what it does. But it will say, you know, three people are standing in a room. Uh, there is one person in the foreground and they look angry and then it will share or it will you know kind of play out loud the actual audio of the show so it just gives you even more of an understanding of what's taking place on screen mm -hmm. even if you're unable to see it but there's a way to make this turn on by default so you don't even have to go looking for it and toggle it on how do they do that yeah, so under settings and accessibility, audio descriptions is right there at the top under vision and you can go ahead and turn it on. And I have it turned on. I tend not to really watch videos on my phone, so I've not encountered it automatically using um, the uh, that particular kind of audio track from you know films and so on. But where this for me has been really useful is when you're driving along and somebody sends you a picture of something and all you would usually get is you know, Micah sent a message, as uh, Micah sent an image. Great. Thanks, Siri. That's not very helpful. But when audio descriptions is on, Siri will actually try to look at the picture and describe it to you, which can end up with some very interesting moments, uh, but it can often usually get it pretty darn right. Uh, so a friend sent me a picture of some really cute boots a while ago, um, and they're sort of like a, a navy uh boot with a brown heel and brown, uh you know, uh, uppers. And, uh, Siri described the picture to me as a blue boot with a brown heel and brown top. And I was like, okay, well, at least I know what we're talking about now. And I also know this message is not super important and I can respond to that later when I'm not driving. But it does mean that, you know, if you are uh, not able to look at your phone right now, maybe you're cooking or something, so you're trying not to touch your device, uh, then when you get those audio descriptions um, or audio announcements of messages, then the images can be described as well, which is a handy little built-in feature. 
Nice. And then last but not least, uh, a wonderful demonstration, uh, hopefully, that Rosemary is going to provide uh, for us that involves being able to control your devices uh, with yeah. another device. Control your other yeah. devices with your iPhone. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, you've got your iPad and maybe you're playing a film on it or something and you would like to use your phone as a remote control. Now, if you're using your iPad with, say, Keynote, um, then you can actually use Keynote remote and that's a built in thing. And for some apps, there are just remotes that you can use. Amazing, but not for everything. And that's where the feature that is on the iPhone uh, and the iPad, actually, of control nearby devices comes in. So I'm actually going to pop over and I'm going to do, aha, it works perfectly. So uh, I have my iPad in the background. I've got my iPhone over on the left and I'm in the bottom right. So on my iPhone, I'm going to turn on control nearby devices and I'm going to select my iPad adorable, which is failing to connect. No, there we go. iPad adorable has popped up. So now I have a couple of buttons here. So I can tap on the control control center button, for example, and ta-da, it's popped up my control center. Or I could uh, tap on the uh, home screen button and it'll go back to the home screen. If I uh, double tap that, then it takes me to the app switcher. Um, I can also uh, just use the app switcher button for this. There is a dot, dot, dot button, which will allow me to do things like controlling media. So I can play, pause, go to the previous track, next track. Um, I can also open my notification center and I can trigger Siri. Now, depending on the device that you are controlling, there may be more options or fewer options available here. But honestly, if you are using like your iPad um, as a, a sort of TV whilst you're traveling in like a hotel or something, and you're just like, oh, it would be so good if if I just had like a remote so that I could like pause the TV, um, you know, uh, from my bed without having to get up and go over to the iPad, um, you know, and tap it, you know, uh, then you can actually use control nearby devices from your phone to play and pause media on, on your iPad, which I love. You'll probably still want to open the app and queue that up from, uh, from the actual iPad. But then once you're lying in bed, you know, you can scrub back a bit inside of a film or a TV show, uh, all from your iPhone without ever having to actually get up. And yeah, this is useful for a number of things, uh, especially in conjunction with something like the Keynote remote for, uh, you know, doing a Keynote presentation. But it's very handy on your iPhone and iPad as well. All righty. That's going to bring us to the end of the accessibility portion of the show. If there are accessibility tips, tricks, and settings that you use, let us know. iOS today at twit.tv to tell us your favorites. Or, hey, if there's one that you learned about on the show that you're just so excited to start using and telling other people about, we'd love to hear that too. We love that feedback. Um, I'm going to quickly mention a news headline before we move on with the show. Uh, Mark Bloomberg, aka Mark Gurman, uh, has reported that people familiar with the matter say that Apple is in talks with Google to bring Gemini to the iPhone. Gemini is, of course, the uh, generative AI uh, system from Google. And Apple has been long rumored to be working on on-device AI stuff that we are uh, reportedly going to be hearing about for the first time at WWDC in, uh, at some point this summer. But when it comes to uh, off-device generative AI, Apple is reportedly talking to Google and has also held talks with OpenAI. Now, it's unclear what exactly the kind of what this deal would look like, what it would mean, how it would uh, present itself. But this would be kind of another big deal, uh, both a big deal and a big deal between Apple and Google, given that Google and Apple already have a search deal where uh, Google pays Apple a hefty sum to make Google the default search engine on Apple devices. So we shall see how this shakes out, what it means exactly. Uh, but I wanted to mention that uh, Apple is on the lookout for a partnership for generative AI because, again, reportedly, um, the company's own efforts in that particular space have been uh, lacking as of yet. So we shall see. All righty, I can hear the music. It's time for Shortcuts Corner. Shortcuts Corner. 
It's time for Shortcuts Corner, the part of the show where you write in with your shortcuts request. And Rosemary Orchard, our shortcuts expert, provides a response. This week's Shortcuts Corner request comes in from Jim, who writes, I'd like to get a pop-up notification when I get within a certain distance from a location. Say I need to pick up something in a town that's 10 miles away. Not important, but I'd like to get reminded when I'm close to that locale. Could be by zip code or certain distance from an address. Thank you, Jim. Interesting. So I guess, yeah. is, is it, if I could understand that, is it, it doesn't sound like it's just, um, I'm purposely trying to drive to this place and get this thing. It's more like while I'm in the area, I might as well get this thing. Because otherwise, yeah. aren't you just going to that place anyway? So you would know what you're there to do. Yes. Yeah. And this is something which actually I've personally long used OmniFocus for. It has like a nearby thing. So if you've geo uh, pinned your tags, um, then you can pop up a nearby uh, uh, perspective and it'll show you things that are near to your current physical location, which is really handy if I'm at one of those shops and, you know, uh, I can, I can, you know, if I'm in one of those like retail park areas, I could just pop it up and be like, oh yeah, while I was here, I also needed to go to that store. Um, but without selling Jim on, OmniFocus, which, you know, it's a great solution if you're looking for a task manager. It sounds like Jim wants something a little bit more simple. Um, so I am actually going to start with good old fashioned reminders because reminders, believe it or not, can do a whole bunch of these things. So when you create a new reminder inside of the details, you have locations. Uh, so there's default ones, which is your current physical location. So maybe next time I'm here, remind me of this, getting into a car, getting out of a car and your home. And then there's also custom. Um, and I am just going to uh, quickly uh, try and search for uh, uh, somewhere else a moment. And uh, there we go. Uh, so now I have a couple of options. And so I can uh, search for places and I've actually searched for France. Now, um, France is pretty big. Um, like, I think it might be larger than Texas. I'm not sure. Um, it's certainly a very large geographically sized area. Um, and so I have uh, this and I can specify when arriving and leaving. And then once I've, um, you know, once I've got this, I can actually change the pin um, size. So if I were to uh, pick something else, say, for example, Nice Airport, I can actually just drag this out to make this a really large area around Nice. That's, in, that's also including the entire country folks of Monaco, um, this uh, little bubble down here. So you can make these bubbles pretty darn big, um, which is a nice option. So that is definitely somewhere to get started with, uh, Jim. So just using locations in reminders and then reminders will pop up on screen and it won't go away until you dismiss it. So you should definitely see it. But inside of shortcuts, I will just uh, delete uh, this option where I was playing with some of the options earlier. You can actually do a uh, location option um, for something. So you can say arrive. So when I arrive, and this is where it gets a little bit better because you can actually specify within a time range. So I'm just going to leave this as nine till five and I'm going to change this to run immediately. And then you choose your location. So just to avoid sharing of all of the addresses in my um, address book, I'm going to just uh, swap away. There we go. So I've typed in Eiffel and there we go. I'm going to pick the Eiffel Tower. And again, I can change the range on this and make this larger um, if I would like to. So here we go. And now I have this. I can actually create a new blank automation and I can just use the notification option to send myself a notification. Um, and this could be quite useful if um, you don't want reminders. OK, so now and every time I get between the Eiffel, get near the Eiffel Tower, between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., and this is uh, the difference here, um, then uh, it's going to pop up this uh, message for me. So that's quite a simple option, um, and it's not too crazy to do. The only thing is, is if you say, hey, I've done it, you have to remember to go in and delete that uh, automation that you've set up there, which just to remind folks, uh, you do, if you tap on it, then you can actually change it from run immediately to uh, don't run. But instead of tapping on it, if I swipe on it, then I can actually delete that automation. 
But there is one other thing that I wanted to mention. Now, full disclosure, I am one of the team that works on uh, this app, which is Pushcut. Uh, but I'm telling you folks about this because I would tell you even if I didn't work on it. What you can do within Pushcut is you actually have the option to add local triggers uh, for things. So you can add a trigger and you can specify uh, a location um, and as well as a physical GPS location. You can also actually use iBeacons, which are little Bluetooth uh, emitters, um, which will send out um, you know, specific signals, which can be quite useful if you need to be reminded of something like when you get to the fourth floor of this building, if you can stick a little eye beacon somewhere there, then that can be quite handy. Um, and again, you can add a time constraint and you can also uh, have a delay. So um, you can say, hey, if I've been at this place for 45 minutes, then send me this location. But if I've been there for just five minutes and I left, no thanks. Uh, I don't want that. You know, if it's only if I'm still there after 45 minutes, that is worth sending me this notification. So there are some options for you, Jim, and uh, hopefully that answers your question. I suspect starting with reminders is the place to go, uh, but you never know, shortcuts or maybe even push cut could solve your problem too. Oops. All righty, folks, with that, we have reached the end of this episode of iOS Today. We want to thank you all for tuning in, uh, for being Club Twit members, if you are. If you're not and you're listening to the audio version of this show, there is a way to get the video version of this show, and it's by joining Club Twit at twit.tv slash Club Twit. $7 a month, $84 a year uh, will give you access to even more. So uh, consider joining Club Twit. Again, $7 a month, $84 a year at twit.tv slash club twit plus you get so many other benefits that you can read about on twit.tv slash club twit uh get in touch with us ios today at twit.tv as i mentioned we are taking uh just as many non-shortcuts requests and questions as we are shortcuts requests and questions so feel free to reach out with uh, tech support as well rosemary orchard if folks want to follow you online and check out all the great work you're doing where should they go to do that uh, the best place to go is rosemaryosha.com, which has got links to books, podcasts, and uh, apps that I'm involved in. And of course, you can find me in the Club Twit Discord, hanging out in the live chat uh, during the show and checking out the iOS Today channel, where some folks have had really good questions. And also, uh, if anybody has suggestions uh, for future show topics that you might like to see, then Micah put up a post there the other day, which we will be keeping an eye on. So Club Twit members, uh, you know, send us your suggestions. That'll be very exciting. Yes, indeed. You can find me online uh, at chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. On most social media, I'm just at Micah Sargent. Uh, check me out throughout this week as I'll be on many of the shows uh, that get published this week. And Leo Laporte will be back next week. So you'll see a return to normalcy after that. Thank you all again for tuning in. We'll see you for another episode of iOS Today. Bye-bye. <laughs>